I'm Lily Madwip, and I just want to go home. And then my Maxitar chopped her head clean off like swoosh. Whoa, gross. That's Meredith. She's one of my best friends. We escaped from some pretty messed up stuff together. First, it was a crazy magician who wanted to kill her, but then not kill her, and then tricked her into killing other people. That's a long and totally different story. And then we escaped from this place called the Vale that's like the labyrinth in that movie with the Goblin King I can never remember the name of, but it's got tons of puppets. And now we're waiting by a beach for an angel to show up and take us home. You have the coolest adventures. Uh, no, I almost died, like seven or eight times. So many times I've lost count. Meredith shrugs. I don't think she understands the gravity of it. I'm honestly not sure what gravity has to do with things either, but my mom always says that. I don't think you understand the gravity of your actions, Lily. Usually followed by something like, money doesn't grow on trees, or that turtle was a living creature. Gravity wasn't what killed my turtle. That was poor habitat planning. We sit in the tall grass by the beach. Little bugs bite our feet and ankles, leaving itchy red bites. Meredith and I squish them to pass the time while we sit hiding in the tall grass by the beach. I feel a little bad killing something that's alive. I wonder if bugs have tiny souls that wait in their squished bodies like my brother Roger when he got squished by a truck. Do bugs go to bug heaven? Bug hell? There's zillions of bugs in the world, I've been told. I imagine bug hell would fill up pretty quickly. Angels probably look at people like bugs. Just billions of us waiting to be squished and fill our people hell. Somewhere in the grass with us is a pair of decapitated surfer heads, but I'm not about to go looking for them. I can hear heavy fly buzzing activity nearby. That's probably where they are. Meredith and I play rock, paper, scissors. Normally I'm really good at it because I can see things before they happen, but without Pasher to help me, it's really difficult. Meredith wins most of the time. She says it's psychology. You gotta play the other person. I thought that's what we were doing. She also tells me about the new town she's living in. It sounds really nice. I'm happy where I am because I know everything about almost everybody. If we had to move, I'd have to learn everything all over again. Like how Greg from the bus doesn't know he's adopted even though he's got orange hair and doesn't look like either of his black-haired parents. Or the secret to why my old school principal, Mr. Longbow, is so obsessed with eagles. Seriously, if you've ever been in his office, there's eagles everywhere. He probably even has eagles on his underwear. What cartoons do you watch? Meredith asks me. I'm not allowed to watch TV. Mom and Dad thinks it gives me nightmares. Nightmares? I got sick with the chicken pox a few years ago and stayed home and had to take lots of baths and sleep wrapped in a sheet. My mom let me watch PBS. There was this show called The Letter People that had these freaky looking puppets. And the letter T puppet had really long teeth. And I had a dream that night that he was under my bed and tried to eat my feet. Oh. Thinking about the puppet in that show makes me think of Snap and Pop, the two monsters we witnessed murder the two surfers a few hours ago. I call them Krispies because their bodies looked burned up. I can still see that one guy's head getting ripped off in my brain. Ugh, stupid brain remembering all the worst stuff. I wish I could tape over things like that instead of rewind and play them back over and over again. I tug at my ear. Yeah, educational shows are weird and scary. I like the Smurfs. I don't know what Smurfs is. She starts to describe it. I just nod and bite my lip and watch the sky getting darker overhead and pinch another buggy that was crawling over my foot looking for a spot to nibble. It feels like forever. Meredith and I sit in the tall grass, waiting for the angel Nathaniel said was coming. We're too scared that the Krispies are nearby to come out of hiding. I peek my head out every now and then to see if anyone's there. I'm afraid the angel's going to show up and not be able to find us. I'm more afraid that I'm going to see a pair of familiar-looking surfers in wetsuits. I hear the sound of a car coming. It sounds like it's not a very happy car. I peek over the top of the grass and see headlights. All I can think is that it's Felix coming for me again. I have to remind myself that he doesn't know where we are. Well, then again, I don't know where we are either, so maybe that makes us even. 
A patch of grass nearby bursts into flames. Oh, declares Meredith. Oh my goodness. She tries to pat out the fire with her bare hands. That was me. Sorry. The car screeches to a halt right in front of us. There's a man behind the steering wheel. It's not Felix. He's much older, like in his 60s or hundreds, I'm not sure. All his hair is white and he's got a big beard. He almost resembles Santa Claus if Santa was on a diet and drove around in an unhappy sounding car. I sigh in relief. There's a dog sitting in the passenger seat beside him. One of those big blonde ones with cute eyes and a pointy snout. I think they're called golden retrievers. It's got a chain with a set of tags soldiers wear around its neck. The man and the dog look out the window in our direction. I hope it's too dark to see the top of my head, but I hold perfectly still in case they do see it but think I'm just a weird plant. Hey, the old man says at the weird plant. I blink. He takes my blink for a hello. Are you Meredith? I'm Meredith, says Meredith, poking her head up out of the grass. Her hands are covered with soot from putting out the fire. Oh my goodness, he says at the side of her face. Poor Meredith. Then you must be Lizzie Magnet. <sighs> Something like that, I say, giving up my disguise. Fair enough. He looks at his dog. The dog looks back at him and seems to nod. The old man turns back to Meredith and me sitting in the high grass. Listen. This dog sent me to get you two girls and take you both home. I don't know what to say to that. Part of me is a little excited at the idea of going home, but the other part of me is hesitant to get in a car with the man who takes orders from a dog. I look at Meredith. She's just as silent as me. Of course, Meredith being Meredith, she may not quite be so suspicious and more excited at the idea of a talking dog. Mr. Santa notices that neither of us are getting in his car. Look, I know it's weird, but so is two little girls sitting alone on a beach in the middle of nowhere this late in the day, and... It's not so weird, Meredith says. We fell out of a hole in the sky. Oh. He looks at his dog again. He looks back at him. The two of them seem to be communicating, but neither one of them is talking. Finally, he turns back to us. The dog says you can tell me all about it on the way home, but right now you really need to get in the car. The dog said all that? I ask. Yup. Just now? Yup. Meredith and I sit there a while in the grass, silently communicating with our eyes like the man and the dog seem to do. Finally, we agree, also silently. Meredith stands up and crosses her arms. I want to hear it from the dog. The dog leans across the old man's lap and opens its mouth. Get in the car. Good enough for me, I say, hopping to my feet. Meredith looks confused. Wait, what? I get in the unhappy-sounding car, climbing in the back behind the dog while Meredith gets in behind Santa. My first instinct is to pet the golden retriever, but I remember you're not supposed to pet strange dogs without letting them sniff your hand first, so I hold a hand out. The old man leans around to check on us, sees me holding out my hand, and shakes it. Name's Mortimer. He says... I would have been here sooner, but the dog isn't the best at giving directions. The dog stares at him with its dark eyes. I half expect it to defend itself, but it just sits there like a dog normally does when it's not talking, which is normally all the time. Mortimer drives off and we leave the beach behind us. I'm excited to get home and give my parents a hug. I hope they remember me. Maybe they aren't even there anymore? What if it's like that movie Flight of the Navigator and I've come back years later and my family all moved to Florida? I don't want to live in Florida. The humidity makes my already crinkly hair curl right up. Just being by the ocean has already started that. Maybe I'll get home and they won't even recognize me because my hair's curly. I wish I had a hairbrush. Maybe they put my photo on a milk carton, I say. I realize I said it aloud. Whoops. Hmm? Asks Mortimer. Nothing. I look out the window as we turn down a long road towards houses. I wonder if Snap and Pop are out there somewhere, twisting the heads off of people while trying to find us. 
I don't know what they were and it scares me that they're out there in the world right now. It makes me wish I'd never ripped a hole in the veil to begin with. But it was what Nathaniel told me to do. The inside of the car smells like oranges and cough syrup. There's a Rand McNally Road Atlas on the floor. My dad always uses one when he's planning trips. I like to look at them and see how far away places are from other places. It's crazy to think that the length of your finger can be like a hundred miles. I pick up the atlas and flip to Massachusetts. Do you know where we're going? Meredith asks. Mortimer nods. This dog here gave me both your addresses. It's a bit of a hike. You girls sure are far from home. Does your dog have a name? I ask. I stuff the atlas in the back of the doggy's passenger seat. The dog looks out the windshield like it's monitoring the horizon or something. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not my dog. I'm just chauffeuring the thing. Hell, this isn't even my car. He notices us looking at him funny in the rear view. Look, when a dog runs up to you and starts talking, you don't ask questions. You just do what it says. Borrow this car from someone who will probably notice tomorrow. So let's get you home quick, okay? That sounds like something a serial killer would say. Meredith mumbles. The golden retriever leans around in its seat and looks at me with its dark eyes. It hasn't spoken since telling us to get in the car, and I'm starting to worry that we've been tricked by this Santa-looking guy. Maybe he's one of those ventriloquists who can make animals and puppets talk. I saw one once at a birthday party, and he made all the kids cry. Not me, though, because I saw scarier puppets on TV. Lily, says the doggy. Doggy, I say back. Meredith watches me with her standard look of confusion. It's kind of a half look because only half of her face really works right. The other half just sort of looks sad and red and a bit saggy because she got burned long ago. Am I the only one in the car who can't hear the dog talking? My name is Jophiel, says the dog. It speaks without moving its mouth. Come to think of it, dogs don't have lips and it speaks pretty clearly for something without lips. We met briefly in the Vale. This is my totem. Oh, of course it's not the actual dog talking. Your totem is a dog? The tag around her neck, actually. The dog is the holder. Okay, that's a new one. The angels are recruiting dogs as well as people. That opens up all kinds of possibilities. Angel totems being held by octopuses, angel totem snail shells. Nathaniel could have been given to a groundhog that sets forest fires. Raziel might be out there somewhere telling a monkey with a big red butt everyone's secrets. Actually, that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Why a doggy? I ask. The dog cocks her head. Her tongue hangs out like she's a happy girl. It wasn't my choice, Jophiel says. It originally was in the possession of a young man in the army, but things went wrong. Thankfully, steps were taken to get it away from him, and it's been on this canine ever since. A lot of work went into it. It's regrettable, but eventually everything will get sorted out. It always does. Angels are so optimistic. Except Dumma. I could take you off the dog, I offer, and give you to someone worthy. No, no, don't touch it. Thank you, though. Nathaniel is right there with Meredith. You wouldn't be able to control it. Believe me, the dog is the best place for it right now. Well, now I'm curious. What does your totem do? I glance at Mortimer. He seems to be listening intently, too. Every now and then, he strokes his Santa beard and side-eyes the dog. That's when you look like you're looking forward, but turn just your eyes to look sharp to the side. People usually do it when they don't want someone else knowing that they're actually looking at them. I hope he watches where he's driving. It's getting dark out and Cars and me have a bad history. I... I, I can't say. Jophiel says. You're not the only one who can hear me. Mortimer snorts and looks forward again. Let's just say that in the wrong hands, it would be bad. Incredibly bad. I had to be very careful to get this ride. Mr. Leech here is slightly unstable. Which is why he can hear us, but he's harmless. Trust me, Raziel vetted him carefully. Mortimer frowns. 
He fiddles with the knobs on the dashboard a bit. Maybe he doesn't know where the button for the headlights are because we're driving dark. Are we safe? I ask. Jophiel is silent. The dog flops its tongue around and pants a bit. I can appreciate how it must feel. The car is getting hot. I wonder if it can hear Jophiel too. Mortimer obviously can. Now I wonder if other unstable people can hear the angels like I can. And animals. Meredith nudges me. What's it saying? I hold up a finger. Jophiel? Are we safe? No. I was hoping for a better answer. Let's try yes for once. Yes, Lily, you're safe. You never have to worry again. Samuel is dead and the veil is closed and all the other nasties that were in it are stuck there and you can now grow up and be a normal adult. There's nothing to worry about anymore, except gym class because they always play dodgeball and everybody enjoys trying to take your head off with those big red balls. Things are a bit chaotic here, Lily. I can't tell you everything. What you need to know is that two Fey escaped before the veil was repaired. They're called Dulahan, and they are not something you can deal with. Not you, and not Meredith. I think we saw them. The crisps snap and pop. They killed these two guys on the beach. Nathaniel told us. They were apparently just waiting patiently in the void for something like this to happen. These things are bad news. Where they go, people die. You can't stop them, not you and not Meredith. Now, there's a good chance they're not here for you. They don't answer to Samuel, so we're just going to have to pray. Do angels pray? Who do they pray to? It's gotten seriously dark out now. I peek around the front seat. The road is really hard to see. I realize Mortimer is driving with his headlights off, and that's not how you're supposed to drive at night. It seems like his eyesight isn't very good either because he keeps leaning over the steering wheel and I see him squinting in the rearview mirror. Please don't crash, Mortimer. If you do, I'm going to think I just can't get in a car without getting in an accident anymore. Mortimer tugs at his collar with a finger. I think the heat in this old jalopy is busted. I realize it's not the car that's heating up. Meredith has been sitting there this whole time, anxiously twisting her Barbie's head around and around, watching me talk to this dog and asking it ominous questions about whether we're safe or not. The air around her is wavy with the heat she's giving off. She's right next to this other totem and literally turning the car into an oven, slowly cooking us all. I grab her wrist and stop her twisting Nathaniel's head off. We are going to be okay, I say. She's been holding her breath, but she finally lets it out in sighs, trembling. Her mouth turns up in a half smile. We are going to be okay, she repeats. The air cools slightly. That's not what the dog just said, Mortimer remarks, glancing at us in the mirror. The air instantly goes hot again. Meredith's arm becomes too hot to touch, and I yank my hand back with a small shriek. Stupid Mortimer! No, 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 no. I wave my hands at Meredith and she sets the oven to broil. Who's your best friend? Meredith grits her teeth and squeezes her dolly. You are. And who's just some random nut who picked you up in a stolen car with a talking dog? He is, she whispers, having to think about it. The oven dial winds down. Hey, hold up a second there, Lizzie, Mortimer says from the front seat. The car weaves into the other lane briefly. He clenches the steering wheel and steadies the car, but is clearly upset. Jophiel intervenes. Stay on the road, Mr. Leach, and be quiet. Mortimer mutters to himself. I don't need to take that from no girl or no dog. Remember our agreement, Mortimer, Jophiel says. It seems to put him at ease, and he gives me one last grumpy-looking glance in the mirror before going back to focusing on the road. We drive on in silence. There's clearly an air of discomfort now. I don't think the Santa Claus lookalike appreciated being called a nut, but I had to keep Meredith from roasting us all alive. Meredith and I hold hands in the back seat. She's only medium well done at the moment, warm to the touch and redder than usual. Kind of like she's waiting for something to happen to switch into full-on fireball mode. I'm just trying to constantly keep her calm so being near the dog doesn't blow us all up. I never thought I'd have to say anything like that. 
I lose track of time. I need to find my lucky charms watch when I get home. Out the window, I keep thinking I see dark shapes looking back at us from passing buildings. Are the Crispies hunting me? Is Pasher okay? Is he waiting for me to get home to tell me everything that's happened? After what seems like days to me, we turn onto a street I recognize. I feel my tummy doing somersaults at the thought of finally getting home after everything that's happened. There's the corner where I wait for the school bus. I wonder if I'll have to go to school tomorrow. I don't even know what day it is. I have no idea how long I've been gone. Oh God, I'm gonna barf, I'm so excited. I squeeze Meredith's hand. Hmm? She asks. This is my street, I say eagerly. It's that one on the left with the rooster-shaped mailbox, Mr. Leach. We pull up in front of my house. It's dark. All the lights are off inside. Are mom and dad asleep? I hope they're home. I don't have my house key. I think I left it in the nurse's office back at school. Jeez, that feels so long ago. Like months. What now? Mortimer asks, looking at the dark house. Stay here with Meredith, Jophiel tells him. I need to talk to Lily privately. Lily, say goodbye to Meredith. And don't worry, she'll be okay. Mortimer, pull around the corner so nobody sees you. I look at Meredith. It's been so long since I've seen her. She and I went through so much together over a year ago, and she's been gone ever since. Hey, I'm happy I got to see you again, I tell her. But next time, let's get together and play on Earth. Meredith giggles. Is there going to be a next time? We both stop smiling. There probably isn't going to be a next time. It isn't safe for us to be together. At least, not with our totems. Together, we burn down houses, set jerk girls' backpacks on fire, kill police officers, almost cook each other in cars. We don't have the best record when it comes to hanging out. I don't say it, but I hug her and I think she understands that the answer to her question is no. I hop out of the car. The dog paws at its doors until I let it out. Then we walk around to the front of my house. Mortimer drives off slowly like he thinks the car has a sneak mode. My dad's a heavy sleeper, Mortimer. I think you'll be okay. Mom says he can outsnore any noise. At the front door, I pet the dog finally. She likes it and sticks her nose into my hand. I want a doggy so bad. If it wouldn't be disastrous, I'd try to keep this dog, but there's no way angels would allow it. Lily, Jophiel says. What do you think of Samuel? Pfft, I nearly spit. He's evil, of course. Everyone has a purpose, you know. I can think of some people who don't really have a purpose. Lisa Welch, for example. I wonder where she is right now. Sleeping in her stupid giant bed covered with pound puppies, probably. What's his purpose? Being evil? The veil is not just another realm, he says. It's also a wall, protecting something incredibly valuable. I shrug. So what? If you build a wall to protect your most valuable item, how would you know that wall worked? You wouldn't, so you need someone to test it and make sure it's strong enough to protect what it's surrounding. Okay... I think this is an analogy, and I hate analogies. I always want to take them literally, and it never makes sense when I do. Samuel resides in the veil, but he also tests the veil. He constantly tries to find ways to crack it or tear it down completely. And when he does, we simply rebuild it stronger. It's vital that he does this, even though his methods may seem evil, in order to ensure that the item it protects is safe. It sure seems like he wants out of there. I hear Jophiel sigh. <sighs> Long ago, he volunteered for this task because he was the strongest of us all. But we soon realized that he wasn't putting everything into it because he wanted to believe the veil was perfect. It was decided by our creator that the only way to make him try everything he possibly could was to lock him in. When he realized what he had done, sure enough, his efforts to tear it down tripled. Essentially, the veil became his prison. Doesn't it matter that he's ruining other people's lives? 
I ask. He almost killed me. And there's a boy in there named Ambrose who's been trapped for years. Does God think we're less important than testing your stupid wall? He doesn't answer. He doesn't have to. I already know the answer. It's yes. I said earlier I wished someone would say yes rather than no. But now I want no back. Lily, there's something else you need to know. Pasher and Duma are still unaccounted for. I don't like the sound of that. What do you mean? They haven't returned from the Vale. Abaddon came back alone. He said he lost track of the others after stitching the rip shut. He doesn't know where Pasher and Duma went with Samuel, and it wasn't safe to stay alone, so he returned. Don't worry, they can't die like mortals can. That's not how things work. And as long as Duma and Pasher are together, they should be okay. They make a formidable team. It would have been better if Abaddon had stayed with them, but don't worry. Okay? Don't worry. So I'm going to be stuck here not knowing if Pasher will ever be back? The dog woofs. I pet it some more. You'll just have to have faith. I have faith. Pasher always finds his way back to me. He's done it a hundred times before, he'll do it a hundred more. Take care, Lily. It's so weird saying goodbye to a dog, but I hug it around its neck. It puts its paw up on my shoulder. I want to squeal, it's so cute, but I don't because I'm really tired and want to see my mom and hug her and go to bed and sleep for a hundred years like that guy Rip Van Winkle. Jophiel and his holder dog walk down the front steps and wait near the bushes. I try the door, but it's locked, so I ring the doorbell. I can hear it ding-donging inside. I never thought I'd feel butterflies in my stomach from the sound of my own doorbell. After a minute of nothing, I ring it again. Through the door, I see the upstairs light come on and my dad's legs in his fuzzy pajamas heading towards the stairs. I knock on the door to make sure he keeps coming. That's my cue, Jophiel says. I can't be seen here. And remember, don't tell them about any of this. The dog scampers off in the direction of Mortimer and Meredith in their stolen car. I watch them disappear around the corner. Something inside me makes me want to yell for them to come back. Come back, let's go on a road trip together, all four of us. Let's go somewhere the Krispies can never find us and fight crime or something. Someone fiddles with the lock on the door behind me. Don't tell them about any of this? Are you kidding me? Mom, Dad, it's me, Lily. I'm home. I've missed you. I'm not dead. I was abducted by Greek monsters and kept in a labyrinth and forced to fight my arch enemy, stupid Lisa Welch, in a knife fight. I fell through a hole in the sky and a crazy hobo with a talking dog drove me home. That's definitely not how I want to go about this. They just cart me off to the Happy Vale Sanitarium and let me roll around in a padded room until all my hair fell out. I hold my breath. The front door opens. It's... it's not my dad. It's someone else, tall and thin and familiar, a silhouette in the doorway. He's wearing my dad's pajamas, but they hang loose off of him. My heart sinks in my chest. I should have run after the dog after all. Hello there. He holds up Pasher's totem. My old doll with the black vest and pants and drawn-on tie that Nana made for me. We've been waiting for you, says Astyanax. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast, if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I wanted to remind you guys also that my wife sells loose leaf tea at Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. She has different teas, including creepy pasta teas, and you can get a Mr. Creepy Pasta tea. If you ask for a dabbing sticker, she also has those. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Hahasaha 
Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakine, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chabinski, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barnfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Rihanna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>